Well, good morning, Liberty. Glad you made it this morning and worshiping with us this morning. And uh, ladies, we honor you today. Happy Mother's Day to you. We, we just want to lift up the vital role that you play in shaping human life in the image of God. And, and uh, we don't say that as people who are unaware of the hard and painful realities that sometimes go with being a mom, from miscarriages to just the demands of being in the trenches with little ones to wayward children who break your heart and all of that kind of stuff that goes with being a mom. But don't, don't ever let any of that overshadow or just eclipse the value and worth of what you do. Uh, it's so critical. And I just hope that today that you feel encouraged. And, and, you know, you think about motherhood and just how central to that was to how God chose to save the world by bringing Jesus into our world through the womb of one woman. So, all right. Well, we're going to, uh, by the way, because it's Mother's Day, we are just like canceling our theology class. Uh, and I would figure some of you probably have plans this afternoon, so we'll just push that theology class off to, to next Sunday um, and just let the day be about you in that way. So let's pray. Lord God, I want to pray for the moms in this room, maybe some of them that are still in the middle of raising children and, and nurturing human life. I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them in that role. And I want to pray for the moms in this room who have adult children, that you would give them the wisdom that they need to see how to walk alongside of their adult children. And, and uh, Lord, uh, what, what that entails in each circumstance for them. And I want to pray, Lord, for the parents in this room that have adult children that have walked away from you, Lord. I pray that you would bring them back, that you would restore them to a right way of being with you. And, and uh, Lord, I pray for the mothers in this room whose hearts ache and whose hearts hurt for different things going on in the lives of their children or for the losses of children. And I pray, God, that you would fill that ache with yourself and that you would comfort them and console them in a way that only you can. Lord, we turn now to our time in your word, and we pray that you give us ears to hear, that you give us eyes to see, and that your word would land on good soil in our hearts and bear good fruit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the story that we're going to look at today actually starts out with a mom. How coincidental is that? All right. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, this is Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Many years ago, there was a Congolese man that was in our church family, and his name was Francis. Actually, it was really Musaliwa. We just called him Francis for short, and... And uh, he affectionately nicknamed my wife Mama Pasta. He called her Mama Pasta. And uh, we don't know the 
the name of this mother of the sons of Zebedee, but these are the Apostle James and the Apostle John. So should we call her like Mama Apostle? I don't know, but uh, we'll call her Mama Zebedee. We'll call her Mama Zebedee this morning. Mama Zebedee's working the angles. She's working the angles. Nothing's too good for her children. She's trying to get the best deal for her sons. You know, you glorify the child, you glorify the mama, because the mama's heart is walking around in her children's body. I mean, think about it. Every day is going to be Mother's Day when your two sons are ruling the planet right next to Jesus. That sounds good. One on his left, one on his right. Of course, those seats of authority to go, should go to my kids. I mean, what other kids should they go to, right? That's a mama for you. But there's actually more. There's more to this uh, than, or I should say, there's more mom than meets the eye to what's going on here. Because you'll notice that when the others found out about it, they weren't upset with Mama Zebedee. They were upset with James and John. They see who's masterminded this little scheme. And you read Mark's account of this story, and it doesn't even mention Mama Zebedee. There's a lot of, of those two brothers that's behind this request. And the other apostles are offended at them. They see kind of how this was a, a sneaky maneuver to try to outrank the others and end up on top of them. And maybe they're offended because they didn't think of it first. I don't know. But you know, you get the sense that there was this expectation going on in their minds that glory was just around the corner. And Jesus would make it to Jerusalem and then he would enter into the city and then something supernaturally spectacular would would happen and just overthrow their enemies and Jesus would establish himself as the greatest of all world powers and kind of come into his glory and reign as the world's king. And, and what they're asking is we want to be second in glory only to you. So, so we'll be beneath you, Jesus, but just say that everybody else gets to be beneath us. Right? That's kind of the nature of the request. And of course, once this leaks out to the others, you know, some strife and erupts between the apostles, and they were often given to arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. But what Jesus sees is that there's something missing here. There's something missing from their mindset, and what's missing from their mindset is humility. It's humility. That without a heart of humility, they are not ready to act as the kingdom leaders that he's making them into. There's a kind of humility that Jesus wants from them. It's the kind of humility that lives in Jesus first, and by God's grace, it can live in us too. And so I want us to use this story to just think about the kind of humility that Jesus desires from us. Number one, it is humility that is shaped by an expectation of suffering. It's humility shaped by an expectation of suffering. Are you able to drink the cup I am to drink? You will drink my cup. Now, what is that about? Well, in their striving to be first, they're forgetting something, that they follow a king with a cross. And right now, their minds are on wearing a crown. Jesus wants their minds to be on carrying a cross. And cup was often an Old Testament metaphor, which referred to sufferings that God sent upon somebody or a people group as a consequence of their sin, divine judgment upon human evil, the sort of idea of drinking the cup of God's judgment or drinking the cup of God's wrath and having to drain that down to its dregs. And this very much alludes to Jesus' sufferings as our sinless substitute and our righteous representative, that, that, that God will send him to the cross and God will be condemning our sin in his crucified body. And they are called into the fellowship of those sufferings. Jesus calls all of his disciples 
to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. Now is not the time to be putting on a crown. Now is the time to be picking up your cross. And that the path to kingdom glory passes through suffering. Riding the road up with Jesus starts with riding the road down with Jesus. And sharing in those sufferings. And that means all kinds of things. That can mean facing the rejection that he faced or the social ostracism or marginalization that comes with being a believer in Jesus. It may mean accepting the mistreatment of others who stand in opposition to your values and beliefs as a follower of Christ or just enduring whatever difficulty and personal sacrifice you have to do to remain rightly devoted to God in this world. There is a cross before the crown. And Jesus wants there to be this humility that is shaped by that expectation in his disciples. And furthermore, he goes on to indicate that those positions are not like just his to just arbitrarily hand out for the asking, like throwing candy from a parade. Like that's not how this works, right? Like God is running the show here. And and there's a great deal of hardship that goes with how God providentially prepare somebody for those two seats of authority, one at his right and one at his left. But that's what he seeks, is a kind of humility that is shaped by an expectation of suffering in the now. The second thing that Jesus desires is humility that is uh, characterized, well, how, how would I put it, that sharply contrasts with the world's way of thinking about greatness, right? You could say it's a humility that comes from repenting, us repenting of any false versions of greatness that we might have going on in our heads. Let's keep reading. Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And so this is where Jesus wants to give our definition of greatness a radical makeover. Because he says, you know, the world's view of greatness is shaped by what? It's shaped by power. And control. That's what he's telling them. You guys know it, that the rulers of this world, they're on a power trip. They're on a power trip. And being great is about what? It's about taking power over others, lording your authority over others. And how many people do I get to be on top of? And how many people get to be beneath me, exalting me, bending their will to me, making me look good, giving honor to me while I give orders to them? It's it's the power-seeking version of greatness. There's another one that's not mentioned here, but I think it's just as problematic, and that is, if it's not power-seeking, it's popularity-seeking. And how many people are celebrating me? How many people are liking me? How many people are following me? How many people are adoring me and impressed by me? In fact, I, I would submit to you that I think the social media world very much lures people in with those hopes and versions of greatness, that maybe I could be the next viral sensation on YouTube. Maybe I could be the next TikTok star. But here's what Jesus tells his disciples. He says, take that version of greatness and shred it. Just shred it. Because it doesn't work in God's kingdom. God's people will practice their influence differently than that. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So Jesus gives them a new version of greatness that's centered on being a servant to the good of others. Like if you really want to be great in God's eyes, if you really want to be called great in God's kingdom, he says, take the place of a servant with one another. Because being a servant of God means being a good servant of one another. 
get beneath other people and do what's best for them and seek to be a benefit to them. Stop striving to be first and just put caring for the needs and bearing the burdens of others ahead of your own personal gain. Serve them well for their sake. Spend yourself on them for their advantage. And what? What do you have to believe about God to actually live that way? Well, you have to believe something to be true of God to actually live that way, and that is that God is fully capable of looking after your honor all by, yourself, all by himself and doesn't need your help. You have to believe that about God. You have to just, that God can look after my honor, that God can vindicate me and exalt me in his own way and in his own time, and I can just come off any crusade that I'm on to try to get respect from others or get honor from others or get glory from others and just set that aside and just serve the good of the people that God has put in front of me. And Jesus says, that is how you become great in God's kingdom. And you know, furthermore, it's not just that this is the right way to be. It's that this is the only thing that works for the mission of God. You think about it, guys. People aren't served well by me-first attitudes and self-promoting tendencies. Like, power-seeking doesn't make people feel loved. And popularity seeking is about how many people are loving me. But like none of that leads people to Jesus. Like that, that is not, Jesus can't reveal himself very well through that. And it doesn't create the kind of atmospheres where change can happen and uncomfortable truths can be heard. And so if we want to be kingdom influencers who affect people for God in a good way, then we model our influence after Jesus' influence. Many years ago, my grandfather died down in Mississippi, and I never had a good relationship with my grandparents on my mom's side. I was pretty much a stranger to them for most of my upbringing, but I did have a special relationship with my grandparents on my dad's side, and my grandfather passed away, I want to say he was about 92 years old, and I, I really wanted to clear out some space in my schedule and fly down there and be a part of that funeral, and so I had booked a ticket, and about a day before I booked, I was scheduled to fly out, Dana got sick, right? And you guys know what kind of sickness she got? It's when everything on your inside wants to get on the outside, that, that kind of sickness, and I just remember really feeling like in a dilemma that, you know, we had a lot of small kids at the time, and as you know, there's a, it's very exhausting trying to care for little children, and you just can't be sick and weak that way and be Johnny on the spot for the kids at the same time. And so I was moving toward probably needing to just cancel my flight, and I was making some ministry calls on the phone, and I was visiting with a, a gentleman in our congregation. He was a retired dentist, and... And anyway, he was just checking up on me personally after we conducted whatever ministry business we needed to conduct on the phone. And, and I was just telling him, you know, that I was thinking I was having to rearrange my plans. And, and he said to me, he said, Brian, this is a no-brainer to me. You're only going to get one of these. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not like this is going to happen again. Like this is, he says, this is the way it's going to work. You're going to this, and your kids are coming with me. That meant so much to me. And he just went, and his wife went over to our house, and he just took all our kids so Dana could just be in bed and be weak and be sick and focus on getting better. That makes people feel loved by God, being loved by the people of God. And Jesus says, that's what greatness is. A life full of that kind of stuff, that's greatness in God's kingdom. That's greatness in God's kingdom. And it models our influence after Jesus' influence. And so the third place or aspect of humility, is a, it's a humility that arises out of how Jesus served us, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right? Just like remember what story you're a part of. Like look at who you follow. The person who is to come to have first place in all things and be the universal object of submission and adoration and worship where every knee bows and every tongue confesses, that person placed himself last by taking our place at the cross. The one far above you came down to you and got beneath you to carry a cross for you. He debased himself by dying a despised death in the dirtiness of our sin to love us at our deepest point of need. And Jesus says, that's your story. Live inside your story by giving yourselves to serving one another well. Because when we're, on, when we're power seeking, we've stepped outside of the story. When we're popularity seeking, we've stepped outside of our story. Like, let's get back in our story, because that's your story. Live inside that story. You were saved through an all-time act of humility. And so live in that story by striving to put the good of other people first, setting aside any thoughts of personal gain to do so. And then lastly, it's humility that is anchored in us rooting ourselves in our ransomed identity, right? To give his life as a believer in Jesus. If you are a believer in Jesus, we have a ransomed identity. What is a ransom? A ransom is a price that is paid to liberate somebody from a circumstance they cannot extricate themselves from on their own. We are sold under sin. And a price has been paid to buy us back for God and to set us free. And because that price has been paid, you will not be made to pay it if you believe in the one who paid it for you. Now, I want you to make a note to self here that Jesus not only foretold his soon coming death, Jesus foretold the meaning of his death. There are people that like to try to somehow pit the Apostle Paul against Jesus in progressive, so called progressive Christianity and say that Paul read all sorts of redemptive meaning into the death of Jesus that Jesus never intended for his death. Well, I'd like you to see right here, Jesus is interpreting the meaning of his death. And he's dying a ransoming death for mankind to buy back rebellious humanity from sin and destruction. In fact, he says the Son of Man came to do this. That means his Reason for living was for dying this kind of death. And a ransomed identity, is that a confession of self's glory? <laughs> is that a confession of, of self's strength? Or, or is it more a confession of self's powerlessness and self's weakness that all my hope depended on God doing for me what I could never do for myself? There's no room for self's boasting in that. There's no room for prideful hopes in asserting your dominance over others and trying to soar high on the social food chain somehow. This doesn't fit with that. And, you know, power seeking and popularity seeking, that's about what? That's about us hoping in ourselves, isn't it? But when your heart is resting in your ransomed identity, then you've truly transferred your hope to God. And, and you can relax. It's like, I, I don't need to claw my way up the social food chain and try to get on top of others or be more popular than the next person. I've already won. I've already won. 
I mean, not because I went out and won, but because Jesus went out and won it all for me. I've won. I mean, I already share in his high, holy, and heavenly position. God already sees me seated in the heavenlies with his son. And his exalted position is my exalted position. I've already won. And so I'm free to just get off of that gerbil wheel <laughs> And just give myself in love and in service to other people. To bear their burdens. To meet their needs. To love them in a way that will help them feel loved by God. And that is the kind of humility that that lived in Jesus. And by God's grace, we bring our hearts to Jesus. It's the kind of humility that can live in us. It's a humility that is shaped by the expectation of suffering. It's a humility that stands far apart from the world's false version of greatness. It's humility that arises out of the way Jesus served us, and it's a humility that is anchored in our ransomed identity.